another method for specifying small graphs, and it really only is practical for small graphs, uses the vertex names directly to construct the graph. Specify undirected relations between vertices by any number of minus signs and directed edges using plus signs. A colon operator can connect what are called edge sets, groups of, of uh, vertices that, uh, that are their edges between all of them. Um, I'll admit that I find the syntax a bit confusing for this approach, um, but you can usually figure it out and, and it can be pretty handy. So just to make things concrete, let's say g gets graph from literal, okay, and then a b is a undirected relation, b c. Now we can plot g. Great. We've got our very simple graph there. Now what would directed edges look like? So let's see. G graph from literal. Let's do A plus minus B and then B plus plus C. Let's add one more. Uh, C minus plus D. Plot G. So we see that wherever there's a plus sign, there's an arrow for a directed relation. There are two plus signs between B and C, and so we've got a bidirectional uh, edge there. Okay, let's do something slightly more interesting. Uh, here's a, a graph G, we can plot it. We got something that's sort of kite shaped, and it's a little busy. Um, I find that when the vertex labels, like the names of the people in your network, uh, matter a lot. It's often useful to suppress the plotting points altogether. So these, these filled circles here. Uh, and we can do that very conveniently um, using by specifying uh, the argument that vertex shape is none. Okay, we can do that. We get something that looks like that. Honestly, I, I prefer a, a sans serif font. Uh, for vertex labels. Um, so we can use the vertex label family equals Helvetica here to get something that looks like that. I like the looks of that a little better. So here's our small group. Um, so our graph from literal. This connects uh, the edge group of Daphne and Velma to Fred and Shaggy. That is both Daphne and Velma are connected to both Fred and Shaggy. But note, importantly, that they're not connected to each other using this syntax here. Um, there's also a connection between, the, uh, between Fred and Shaggy and between Shaggy and Scooby, okay? So that's the graph that we get here. I realize that these names are not arbitrary and I wanna emphasize I'm not making any statements about the Scooby gang's relationships, don't at me. Sometimes a graph is just a graph, all right? Um, Let's see. I think that's probably all we need to say about graph from literal. Let's move on to talking about uh, a bunch of the built-in graph classes for special graphs that we can create in iGraph. Okay, so sometimes we want an empty graph, which is just a set of vert vertices with no edges connecting them. Here is an empty graph with 20 vertices. Call it G0. Oops. There we go. We've got 20 vertices laid out pretty much at random with no edges connect, connecting them. And actually I'll probably, because it's a little faster uh, and definitely easier 
work from this script up here, okay? So there's, a, there's the empty graph. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum from the empty graph, of course, is the full graph in which every vertex is connected to every other. So we can make a full graph using the command make full graph. Well, again, we'll use 20 vertices. We get that, we can plot it, and uh, we get that. It's, it, if we were to add many more vertices and, and have a full graph, it would be hard to see because it would basically just be all edge that we'd see. It would be all gray uh, and difficult to visualize any of the relationships there. Um, I also want to note that in these plots, pretty much for all of these plots, I'm going to suppress the vertex labels because there's, there's not really any information contained in them. They're just numbers uh, and it busies up the plot. So we can, uh, we can suppress that by saying vertex lab label equals NA. And also I changed the vertex size. You can play around with this and see what looks good for you. But uh, I found for these relatively small graphs that a vertex size of 10 works pretty well. Okay, so we got the full graph. Another built-in class of graph uh, that can be very handy is a ring graph. A ring is a single cycle, where a cycle is a path that starts and ends with the same vertex. I guess I should note, at the risk of going down a rabbit hole of graph theory, that a path is a walk with no repeated vertex, and a walk is an alternating sequence of vertices and edges. Yikes. Back out of the rabbit hole. Okay, all the vertices in a ring will have a degree of 2. That is, they'll be connected to exactly two other vertices. Okay, so let's make G2 our ring of 20 and plot it. And there we go. It's a ring, not surprisingly. We can make a lattice. Uh, technically, we can make a square lattice where uh, we give it we say make underscore lattice, and we have this. Uh, this funny argument, dim vector equals C 10, 10. So we've got uh, 10 rows and 10 columns of, uh, of a matrix underlying that. Okay. And we can plot that. And the layout seems a bit funky, uh, a little distorted, not really what you probably have in mind when you're plotting a lattice. Um, we typically want our lattices to look, you know, square. Um, so we can specify a layout to fix this little bit of funkiness, and that layout, not surprisingly, is called uh, layout on grid. And it, you know the layout on grid gets the argument of the graph, and that gives us probably what we were looking for when we wanted to generate a lattice in the first place. It looks like a nice square grid, much better. Okay, next uh, we can specify a tree. A tree is an acyclic connected graph. The first argument is, as usual, the number of vertices in the graph. Okay, so we've got a, we've got make tree. We've got 20 vertices. The second argument is a little bit more inscrutable. This is the number of children each internal vertex has. Okay, the, so every vertex in, inside the graph, on the interior of the graph, will have uh, a degree of, of three, right? Whereas the leaves, the exterior uh, vertices, will, uh, will not have children, right? Okay, so we can specify that and plot it. And I should actually say it isn't that, the, that uh, so children equals three, let's see. Yeah, children equals three doesn't mean that they, the interior ones have a degree of, of, of three. It means that they actually have a degree of four um, because they're coming out of their ancestral uh, vertex as well. Okay, uh, all these are the leaves. These are the, the terminal vertices. They all just have uh, a degree of one. Okay, uh, so that's a tree. We can specify a star. Um, and actually, I'm going to, because 20 makes for an ugly star, uh, I'm going to make a star uh, that is uh, that has an order of 10. And now we can plot that, and we have a star. So 
These are often called in graph theory k stars. A k star is a graph of order k plus one with a maximum diameter of two. Okay, so the furthest we can go in this star is into the middle vertex and then out is two, right? There, there's, there's no path that's longer than two there. Um, uh, let's see, it's, it's actually also a tree. Uh, it's a tree with one internal node and k minus one leaves, right? So we've actually got nine leaves here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and one internal one. So those are our, our 10 vertices that we specified. Um, stars are pretty important in a number of areas in social network analysis, and we'll talk about them a lot in class. Okay. Um, two more built-in graphs that are good to know about are the erdos renyi random graph and the power law graph. The erdos renyi graph is also called a Bernoulli graph. Edges are formed at random following a Bernoulli process. And that is, there's a constant probability of an edge existing between any given dyad in the graph. There are a couple different ways to specify random graphs uh, in iGraph. Probably the most common one is sample G and M where you specify n vertices and m edges. So here, we've got sample GNM, we've got a, a 100 vertices, we've got um, 50 edges, which are randomly allocated. We can plot that, and we see it's pretty sparse. Um, it's not, I mean, that, that's like a, a, a density of 0 0.0025. Um, We'll talk about density some other time. Um, let's see. Uh, alternatively, you can use sample GNP, where again, you specify the n vertices, but this time you specify the Bernoulli probability that's applied to all the dyads in the graph. Uh, there's six one, and we can actually, let's do, come down here and plot. 6.1, you can see it's a little sparser. For most purposes, sample GNM gives you more control since you're specifying the number of edges, which can otherwise be pretty variable if you use the probability specification. Note that the total number of edges in a graph, in a random graph, will have binomial variance, which is equal to um, n times p times one minus p. Okay, so you know, often it's just easier to specify uh, the number of edges that you want in the graph. And so probably sample GNM is, is the better choice. All right, the, uh, the last class of, of built-in graph that we'll consider is, is the power law. Back in the early aughts, a lot of people got quite breathless, breathless about power law networks. And I'm on record as being a bit of a turd in that particular punch bowl. Uh, I'd go so far as to say that power law networks are very rare in social networks. The name power law refers to the degree distribution of the graph following a, a power law of probability distribution, such as a Yule distribution or a discrete Pareto. And depending on the parameters of these, these can have very heavy uh, right tails. So effectively, this means that there are many vertices with few ties and a few with many ties. Power law graphs are typically characterized by a small number of k stars, where k can be a pretty big number. So let's look at this. The, um, the function is sample underscore pa. We'll look at a, a graph of order 100, so 100 vertices. And we'll set the, uh, the scaling exponent to 1.5. We'll make it undirected, all right? And we can plot that, and we see this characteristic. We've got these, we've got these stars. So these couple individuals have lots of connections, and most individuals have few. Most most of these uh, people, if these are people, in the graph uh, have two uh, have a degree of two, right? They have two ties. Um, whereas a few have a lot of ties here. And, you know, if you want, you can look at the degree of G7. Oops, I spelled degree wrong. 
right? So one's got a degree of 25 and one's got a degree of 32. We've got lots of ones in there, okay? And if, if we want, we could even do a histogram of the degree of G7. We got something that looks like that. It's extremely skewed. Most have this very low degree. Uh, one has a very high, one has a, a quite high, and it drops off really fast, but has this, this long and heavy right tail. Um, let's close out the video with a quick introduction uh, to the disjoint union operator. We often use these built-in graphs as building blocks for larger graphs that we're constructing for some illustrative purpose. Having a way of aggregating these different building blocks is very handy. So let's put together our tree and say our power law graphs. We'll use the disjoint uh, union operator, uh, which is the letters DU enclosed by percent signs. Okay, so, uh, well here, we can do this. We can plot it first. And we actually see what our power law graph here and our tree here. We've put them into a single graph, but of course they're unconnected because they're, they're, they're disjoint, right? Okay, so let's do a little more here. Let's, um, let's call it something, we'll call it GG. So GG is the disjoint union of G4 and G7. That's our, our tree and our power law. And then, so we have this single, this single graph, GG. It's comprised, comprised of our two previous graphs. Um, but there, as we saw in the plot, there are no connections between the vertices of G4 and the vertices of G7. Um, we can connect them by doing a bit of rewiring. The command rewire uh, uses, using the argument each edge, um, rewires the endpoints of each, each edge in the graph with a specified probability, okay? So here we'll say GG gets rewire of GG, and we're gonna apply to each edge in graph GG a probability of, of 0.3 that it gets rewired, that, that its endpoints get changed, okay? So we'll do that. We'll then plot it again, and we'll see that it's much more connected. Um, so it's much more connected, but it also has a lot of isolates on it, okay? And for plotting purposes, sometimes we like to take out the isolates. Um, it's important not to forget about them because they're giving you important social information. But for visualization, sometimes it's, it's useful because you can, you can find a lot of real social network graphs um, have a lot of isolates, and that can throw off your plotting algorithms and, and just make it look not, not so great. Um, we will take advantage of the fact that there's also a, a, what we call a giant component here, a strongly connected uh, subcomponent of this graph, and we'll pull that out and plot that. We can use the function induced subgraph, where we're, we're picking a subgraph of our overall graph and we're, the, the thing that we're using to induce it is we're gonna look for the first subcomponent of GG. So in other words, the biggest subcomponent of it. So we're gonna induce a, a subgraph on GG by just picking the first subcomponent. Okay, we can plot that. We got something that looks like that. We might wanna mess around a little bit with the layout, give us something that looks a little more copacetic, but uh, that gives you a sense of, of uh, what to do there, okay? So there's an introduction to some of the built-in graph classes available in iGraph. Next, we'll move away from these toy graphs and, and we'll move on to working with actual relational data of the kind we gather in the course of our field research. So that's where the fun really begins.